Okay, I think we're good to go. Thank you all for joining me this morning for our day text. As you know, we meet regularly every weekday and Saturday morning, unless otherwise scheduled, between 6.30 and 7.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we use this time to progressively work our way through the various biblical books and letters. And this way, we become more familiar with these ancient documents and texts, as well as enjoy each other's company while we do so. So, however, we know that not everyone can join us live. Still, watching the video or joining us live, we, we consider information together so that we can progressively work together in building our understanding. And so I find it a good way to both enrich myself and to help others do the same. I encourage you to make the most of these videos or at least the content related to the text, the text themselves, and share them with people in similar formats, if not directly with the videos, and then talk about them. It's up to you. Whatever's a good way to help other people become more familiar with these texts. And probably just having them take a look at the channel. Not everyone subscribes to YouTube, of, of course. And I am considering other platforms I'm going to upload videos to as, as I continue to develop the, the channel and the different types of videos. Speaking of which, this Sunday we will return to our video series on the pre-Christian evidence that Jesus is the biblical Messiah. We understand that not everyone <laughs> believes Jesus is the Messiah, you know, the one who, in our view, came to save us from the condition that leads to death. So, but this is obviously a, a Christian channel, but it's, it's you know, designed for all people, but specifically for people who, like me, have already reviewed these things and we've come to accept them as reliable. But everyone is welcome to join us and to consider things, ask questions, we just ask that you try to stay with the format or ask questions that are genuine, you know, something you really don't understand and want to discuss further. So with that in mind, I'm going to be doing Isaiah chapter 9. I may combine it with Isaiah chapter 11 or do a separate show on Isaiah chapter 11. That part I'm not sure. But this Sunday show will be C.W. Job Talk 21, Pre-Christian Evidence that Jesus is the Biblical Messiah series. And in that series, what I do is I review texts we have that are basically universally accepted as datable to a time before Jesus was born, before anyone knew who a, what a Christian was. So, uh, you know, we point to that evidence as the best because it shows what the Jews who were following the law of Moses and looking for the prophet like Moses. That was what I, that was C.W. Job Talk 21, Deuteronomy 18. This, they were believing certain things based on what was written and said to uh, be a part of the original prophecy by God in Eden, that there would be a seed that would come, crush the head of the serpent, but he would be bruised in the heel. So we're going to be getting into Genesis real soon in these daily readings, right after Revelation. But this Sunday, we're going to continue that series. So, and eventually we will go back to Genesis as part of the pre-Christian biblical evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. But we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 9 because it ties in, you'll see, in some part, with the, the series we've been doing on Jesus and Michael as the archangel. Because you're going to see that in Isaiah chapter 9, there's some association with Jesus as both a God and an angel, as there often is with these types of beings, but not in a way if they're faithful sons of God that would compromise the Father's one Godship because they reinforce it by their submission to him and doing only what he does, not because they're forced to, but because they realize it's the best things to do. Right? <laughs> He's God. He knows exactly what to do. They realize that. They accept it. They don't put their own desires above what he tells them to do, which is different from other spirits, like the resistor. And as humans who have been born imperfectly through by Adam and Eve, from Adam and Eve, we have a, a kind of conflicted nature. 
<laughs> we're made in the image of God, but we do things in the image of man, humans, and so we die. But we can live, we believe, through Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, that Jews were looking to before Jesus came. So we'll talk about that more this Sunday. Now, as far as our reading, and good morning to everybody. I know sometimes I forget about the names and stuff. I'm sorry, but you know I mean well, and I do, because I'm trying to get to the material. I know everyone's busy, so sometimes if I'm, especially if I'm just a little bit past the seven mark, I just get right to it. I try to, but I see all of you who are there, and uh, Betsy, Robert, Paul, thank you very much for joining me live here, and everybody else too, who just may not be able to post or who may be listening or watching the video. I hope it benefits you. That's my goal. I try to post videos and fill out playlists with some things, mostly, you know, spiritual content or religious, historical, grammatical stuff. But I also have, you know, some of my own interests and things that I think in some related sense help us or motivate people like music, self-help videos. But, you know, I'm not the creator of those things in ways that I can be 100% responsible. Who can, right? Still, I'm not going to let that keep me from recommending things I, that I think can make you feel better. But I try to be limited and keep it to this material when we come together because this is really where we're safe, at least when it comes to the three things, right? But everybody else has different interests, like me. So I try to share some of those along with our uh, review of the religious text. Okay, we're going to get to Revelation 16. So these shows are based on what I've translated to date. I've taken years and spent a lot of time, and I'm not trying to rush this or do it for any other reason than to provide a reliable representation of these texts. Hopefully it's clear that I, I'm concerned about the text in a way that I would try to treat them well, but we all have to be careful and try to focus on the best available reasons, not our own interests. And that's what I try to do with my translations. And so still, that, that means we have to skip some material because I haven't translated everything. It takes a long time. <laughs> and I'm stuck in Proverbs, but stuck in a good way. So um, we're going to read Revelation chapter 16, verses 1, 8 through 9, 15, <laughs> and then 17 through 18. And it's okay because... Remember, we're not trying to provide like a detailed interpretive uh, explanation of all of the symbolism, imagery, and visions here. We're trying to just get a sense of what God communicated to Jesus, according to Revelation 1.1, who in turn, through his angels, communicated to John, and who then wrote to all the Christians, including us. So let's see what he was he, what he was seeing, what he was hearing, and to the extent that we can make an application that's reasonable and helpful and based on our um, understanding and good reasons, we will. But I'm not going to get into, for example, you know, what is the what is the bowl? You know, you're going to see a reference to a bowl, a bowl of God's fury. You know, these so there's obviously representations of things. Because fury is not a physical thing. <laughs> it can manifest physically. But you can't have a bowl of fury, right? So we're dealing with some similar. There's some thing that represents the bringing forth of God's anger to the earth in different ways through these heavenly beings. Verse 1, Revelation Chapter 16, I put the reading in the text below if you want to follow my translation. I heard a great voice from the temple saying to the seven messengers, Go and pour out the seven bowls of God's fury into the earth. Okay, now remember, previously, Revelation chapter 12 talked about the dragon coming down and being thrown into the earth and having great rage. Now, we have God's fury being brought to the earth. 
in seven different ways. Now remember, there's a difference, obviously. When the dragon's thrown out of heaven with that great rage, he attacks the woman. Remember, he tried to get to the woman. The woman was given a place of safety, allowed to get stronger. Dragon unleashes a river, tries to drown her anyway. Earth comes to the aid of the woman, sucks up the dragon's river of rage. And then the dragon goes off to wage war with the woman and her remaining seed. That's not the, the, the objects of God's fury. Remember, remember when Moses was in Egypt and Jah brought the plagues. The plagues didn't hurt the Israelites, not in the direct way that they hurt the Egyptians. And there may be, have been some indirect or consequential discomfort, but in and amongst all their deliverance and the power of Jah through Moses, I'm sure they didn't really care. So there's a difference and look at it in that respect. When the dragon's thrown into the earth, his rage is directed toward the woman, the male child, us. When God's fury is poured into the earth, that's him giving back to every agent of the dragon and everyone whom the dragon didn't touch because they weren't like us. He's not, this fury is not directed at us. Verse 8. So we just read verse 1, seven bowls of God's fury being poured into the earth. We're not going to read about every one, maybe next time. <laughs> but we're going to read a couple of them. Verse 8, the fourth messenger came to pour his bowl upon the sun. And the sun was allowed to significantly increase the temperature on humans by means of severe heat or fire. Now, you know, you hear a lot today about global warming and things like this, and I'm not sure that I see the extent of increase in temperature, at least not that would be like this. But, I mean, could you imagine how much people would complain if it got, like, even on, on a regular basis, 10 degrees hotter, more hot? than today, they'd freak out. They're freaking out right now. And so look at what it says. Verse 9, the humans on whom the temperature was significantly increased by means of severe heat even disrespected the name of God. So let's just say, for example, and again, I just stated, I, I don't see the kind of temperature increase and severe heat that would necessarily indicate to me like verse 8 maybe i mean people are complaining right i mean it's like a an ongoing cry of of media and many people who are influenced by things that don't seem like uh, the most credible science but either way according to verse 9 Instead of, see, this is the difference today. Today, nobody looks to Jah. No, I don't mean nobody as in you and me and, and, and some others. I mean the ones I was just talking about, like the, the global warmers. True or not, I'm not going to get into it as a political issue. My point is the ones most vocal about it. They're not praising Jah and saying, Jah, help us. We have all these humans and these people doing these things, nuclear weapons and stuff, and we think that's causing a lot of the earth to radiate unnecessarily, whatever. They don't do that. They don't ask him. Instead, they act like, you know, they can control, they can control the weather. They can, um, you know, do all these um, chemtrails and things where it seems like they pour a lot of reflective material into the clouds or create clouds with reflective particulates little metal reflective particulates, uh, at least in part from what I've seen, that are designed to help reflect back in the sun. Whether it works or not, my point is they're trying, it's all, they're trying to control it themselves. Instead of asking Jah, the one who controls everything, period, or lets it go in its normal process, he set it in motion, We've lost so much faith, and I'll include us in that today because probably 
we don't ask for it as much either. But we're so influenced by everyone around us to think it's humans when really it may not be as bad as some think. And if it is, it's God who has control over these things. You think humans could override the cycles of Jah? No way. He's never going to let that happen. And I don't even think we could. The extent to which the earth is able to absorb all stuff. Look at the human body and how much it can take and then detoxify. The earth can take, I mean, when you look at what we're really doing, it can take a lot. I'm not saying we should just keep making it worse. You know that. My point is people make more of it, it seems, than the evidence supports. And even if they're right, they're not looking to God, which the evidence supports, right? Life only gives life from life. Doesn't happen any other way. It's always intelligent, balanced, you, uh, made for with utility. That is for purpose and design and function within its environment, which also complements the thing made. <laughs> so the idea that any of this is an accident is not possible. It's not demonstrable in any way. It's a belief. It's a theory. It's wrong. Just saying, because if you have any belief at all in science and what is going on, then you can tell. That none of that stuff actually happens. They just believe it and they talk about it as if it happens. But we believe that the one who made life happen is the same one who makes these things happen. And that's why in Revelation 69 it says, God's the one who has control over these seven plagues, including the temperature increase in the sun. And then look at verse 9. They did not change their beliefs in order to give him glory like i just it, instead of looking to themselves and blaming everybody else and then s taking all this money and then i don't know i just don't see any of the benefits that all these people talk about in terms of green earth and i'm all for a green earth and environmentalism but the the people they do they're like these false charities you know they talk a good game they just don't play one they don't do it right. They don't actually do the game. They just talk about it. Either way, let's finish the reading. So it says they won't change. They just keep looking to themselves, keep blaspheming God. Why, why if God exists, does he make it so hot and all these things and <laughs> whatever they say, it's all dumb because it's not right. It's not based on what's actually happening. It's based on what they put in their mind. It's fantasy about life. It's not based on what actually occurs and what has occurred and that therefore gives us a good basis to consider what might occur. So let's take a look at what it says is going to occur. Verse 15. Behold, I am coming the way a thief enters. We know who talks like that, right? Not because he's a thief, but because he's going to get you like one. And he knows that most of the people he's talking to are probably one or have been one. Or are tempted to be one. And he's making them realize that if that's what they want, then he's going to come as one. And then what are they going to do? It's, a high, it's very easy for criminals and others to play that part until they get played for their part. Then all of a sudden, it's not fun anymore. Same thing they were doing to others is happening to them. Oh no, what? Well, Here's what you do. You don't do it to them, and then he won't come and do it to you. That's why it says, Blessed is the one who remains alert, who pays close attention to his clothes. This way, such a person may not live totally exposed. And people may not look at the shame of what it means. Right? We were made naked. So originally it was no shame. It was only after they did their own thing that they felt the shame. And God said, "What do you? who, who told you that was a problem? Who told you you were naked? Why is that a problem now? It was because of their vanity, not because of God. So that that is why today we don't walk around naked and we feel exposed. We know what that's talking about. I'm not talking about the original Adam and Eve context. I'm talking about the people here in our world, in our, us ourselves, if we're not careful, who are not alert and who don't care and who just keep doing whatever they want to anywhere as if there's no consequence. 
there's always a consequence. It just doesn't always happen right away. Verse 17, the seventh messenger came to pour out his bowl upon the airy region. And a great voice came out from the temple, from the throne. And we know, we know probably who that, that's either Jah or Jesus. And there are some voices and things around the throne. That's, then of course, there are seraphs depicted above Jah's, um, and Jaws being even, and around him. So we, don't, we don't, won't read into it, but we've also known from earlier readings, Revelation 2 and 3, that Jesus sat down with, uh, sat down on his Father's throne after conquering. And so in this way, from the throne it says, it has been done. It's done. It's over. It has been finished. In terms of being accomplished. In other words, there's nothing left that needs to be finished the way it needed to be finished before Jesus finished it. And whether that's finishing it through his earthly life and course or finishing it by the fight he had in heaven, of course, with the devil, as we've read, he finished it. And he's going to finish it completely and give it back to his father, the perfect present the way it was originally meant to be. Although the Father gave it, or said, it's said to have been given for the Son. And that's what he receives. He's such a good son, he makes it even better, gives it back to his Father. Verse 18. Then there came to be lightnings and voices and thunderings. And we've talked about the association between these things with communication from heaven. And then it says, and a great earthquake, the kind which has not taken place since humankind came to be upon the earth. It was a great earthquake like this. So we'll see what happens. We'll see if we experience an earthquake like this. Hopefully not. But if it does, we know. Right? These are the things that are foretold. Even Jesus said there would be earthquakes in one place after another. But that could be over a period of time in ways where we shouldn't burden one another by making people think or be alarmed unnecessarily. Be alert. Pay attention. You don't have to be overly alarmed. You won't be able to give attention to your clothes, to other people the way you need to, and to remain focused on Jah during these times should they take place. Or at any time, we all have difficulty, whether it's because of severe heat, a great earthquake, or something else. But going over these things will help us be more prepared. Don't worry overly. We can't control those things anyway. Not even the ones who think they can control them can control them. Jah controls them. He knows. He knows who is trying to do what's right, and he knows who's not. And that doesn't mean we're always going to be free from difficulty. That's not possible. Because people who are also doing wrong are allowed to show their clothes. Jah must see them. Just like he saw Adam name the animals. Just like he saw Cain kill Abel. He allows these things to take place so that everyone knows. And it's shown by what the person does, good or bad, peace or hostility. How are you going to act? It's going to be a little bit different depending on the circumstance. But one thing you should not change is that God should be given the glory whether it's good or bad. Even verse 9, it says, right after, look at what it says. This is very important. I'll end on this. <laughs> I will give a brief update for it. Well, I already did on Sunday. Either way, verse 9. Look at this with me again. It says the temperature got much hotter, right? Significantly increased severe heat. And the ones on whom it happened disrespected the name of God the one controlling the plagues. Now look at the last part again. They did not change their beliefs 
in order to give him glory. If they would have done that, okay, so the severe heat is coming. They're glad they're disrespecting God. He's punishing them. All they have to do is stop disrespecting his name. He's not doing it because he's a mean God. They're disrespecting his name. He made them to do that. You think he wants them to do it for that long? And even gives them the chance during this plague, like the Egyptians had, to change their beliefs and recognize Jah, give him glory, and you still get to do all these things. You just can't blaspheme his name. He made everything. And even if you don't, fully follow him, blaspheming the one whom history and all science can show is most likely the real one, the true one, is not a good way to go. Either way, this it's not like there's no way out. Even those disrespecting his name can change. Just give God glory for the reasons he should be given glory. He made everything. He gave you the opportunity to do everything you get to do. Just like Jesus says, he makes the sun rise on the wicked and the good. I'm sure he favors the righteous, but the, the resistor has his favorites too. And both continue until the end. So we highly recommend that you give God glory. Hopefully we can help you do that. If not, we all get to choose and we respect you for it. This is our choice. We do it every morning when we can, like this, and Saturdays as well, weekday morning, I should say. And Sunday, we do a special show. You can join me live for a little pre-show discussion. Then we get the show started, CW Jot Talk 21, this Sunday. And then we talk a little bit after. But then I just, I just caption the show part for the video series. Either way, I hope you're enjoying these readings through Revelation. They're interesting, aren't they? A lot of interesting stuff. But just try to carry away the main points. Because there are some. And depending on who you're talking to, they, make, they may make all the difference. 